I'm Nick Sepos. I'm the Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, and welcome to the Zeppos Report. I have the privilege of sitting with a lot of really fascinating, brilliant people who are literally defining the world in which we live in. And my guest today is a very good friend of mine, a brilliant colleague, David Owens, from the Owen Graduate School of Management. Now, I say that, David, but you're appointed in management and innovation. You're appointed in engineering management. You're in radiology and radiological sciences. I don't know if you read any, read any x-rays <laughs> before you came over. I hope not, but make sure you, you, did, you, did, a, you did a good job there. And now you tell me you're appointed Peabody. Yes. Okay, so... <laughs> Um, you know, you're, you're, you're kind I get of, around, I get yeah, around. Well, you, know. you know, that's, you know, why people, you know, you're in demand, you're in demand, you're on the Zeppos report. What can we say? So, uh, you know, in many ways you encapsulate Vanderbilt, which is, oh. you know, we got all these schools, we're all working together. We're all trying to solve problems by bringing all the schools together. Um, I think you've also been a leader, you know, here, your book, uh, about creative, uh, 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 resistance to creativity yeah. in complex <laughs> bureaucratic institutions. Um, you're viewed as Mr. Innovator. You're mm -hmm. viewed mm -hmm. as, you know, I'm going to break down the walls. I'm going to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring everything to the table. So uh, tell me a little bit about how you got to that point. Mm -hmm. What, what, what kind of led you okay. to say, you know, you see left, I see left, but I see right. And then I see another dimension. Okay. <laughs> I don't, yeah, that, that's probably what my, how my wife thinks about it. It's like, dude, like you don't see, <laughs> you don't see normal. You don't see like normal people do. Um, maybe it's um, I, I actually am. I, I grew up biculturally, so I grew up in a house where we spoke German and English. Uh, we sort of very culturally German, but I went to American schools and all that. My father was in the army. Um, and so I could already begin to see sort of both sides of things. Um, and I, um, I kept, kept, I guess I just kept an appreciation for that. And, and even just at the most basic level, it's like when you speak two languages, you realize that there's not like one word for something. And so there's always another way. And so I think for me, it's always been like there's always another way. I was also groomed to be an engineer growing up, and that was just uh, sort of understood, even though I think I didn't even know what that meant. Um, but you know, when I went to college, I went to college, I wanted to make stereos. That was my goal. Just make stereos. But I love the music. Very, very popular, <laughs> very popular in the residence halls, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, but then the my first year of college was really looking at the back of my physics professor's head. You know, he's writing equations on the board. And I'm looking <laughs> at the back. Of I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure he would appreciate that memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, so in, in some ways, it, it got to this point where it's like I can't do it this way. Like this is just not going to work. And actually, I quit school, went uh, and got a job in a high end stereo store. And worked on installs and repair and selling high-end stereos. It got much closer to stereos, but I also realized, like, okay, there's not there's not enough runway there either. And so I went back to school. So for me, it's sort of been bouncing back and forth between um, sort of hands-on doing things and then coming back. Um, I also think that the um, my goal is not to disrupt organizations that I'm a part of. I don't want to be such a a foreign body that I get, you know, the antibodies come out and sort of throw me <laughs> out. Um, I like working within the system. And, and it, even in my sort of my, my theories, my, my half-assed theories of innovation, I really think about the small changes that can make the big change. And so working within the system, what are they really, there, there are so many more possibilities there than, it's easy to go out and like, let's go, you know, get a hundred billion dollars and just like disrupt this whole thing. It's a lot harder to do with no money and with no Well, that's um, what I tell people. No. They say, well, if I had a, a $5 billion, I could really change things. I yeah, said, so right. could I. <laughs> I, think, I think just about anyone would have pretty, right, pretty, right, pretty, yeah. you know, pretty, good, pretty good opportunity. David, um, talk to me a little bit about, I mean, you trained at Stanford. Yeah. I mean, you've got... I don't know. It wasn't that good when I was there. Stanford. <laughs> and, you know, obviously people look at Silicon Valley, yes. Stanford, you know, kind of the growth of, um, you know, Hewlett Packard yes, right. and, you know, kind of Intel and Facebook and Apple. Yeah. Um, tell me, what do you see at Vanderbilt over the last five years, not to mimic mm -hmm. what is happening there, certainly learning from yeah. it. I've spent time out there, but really, to move our university to a kind of innovation space, maker space, yeah, yeah. Um, and really kind of tying some dots or linking dots where 
we put Opportunity Vanderbilt in place yeah. where we have all of these brilliant kids coming. We're going to a, you know, a college system where everyone's living and learning on campus. Yeah. We have faculty living in the residence halls. What has Vanderbilt done, you think, that you would say, boy, I'm pleased because innovation can be difficult in these institutions. Yeah. Yes, it really can. And, and for me, so I've been here since 1998, so almost 18 years now. When I first came, it was almost a respite from Silicon Valley. It's like, oh, God, like it's so um, crazy there. and Traffic was horrible and prices were horrible and all that, that kind of stuff. And I think over time here, um, some of the things I've seen that, that first start with sort of Nashville, but maybe, uh, it's, maybe it's the South as, as a whole, but certainly Nashville – um, the thing that struck me is that everyone wants you to like Nashville. And so people are really willing to go out of their way to um, give you access to – I remember on, on, on the, literally on the plane flight on the way here with our babies the first time, someone uh, was saying, hey, here's the phone number of my babysitter. And I'm like, you don't give that away. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> you don't give and you don't away. take it either. <laughs> right, right. And so, um, and so what, I, what, what I found in my sort of you know, uh, journeys around, uh, around Nashville and, and, and uh, going places is that people like – to um, want you to like it, so they, they tell you things. Um, also, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on, and it just hadn't been completely connected up yet. Uh, so, for example, I would say in Silicon Valley, there's lots of motion of ideas and of people, and, and, and um, Nashville has been, I think, a little bit more stable uh, heretofore, but before this, um, but that the, the ideas are here. And the people are here. They just hadn't been talking enough to each other. Now that's what's happening. And so we're bringing in people from the outside, and the people are connecting through that. Uh, the Wondery, you know, or the Campus Innovation Center, really is just meant to be a hub of links to the all the different things. Like there's some cool stuff. There's a company in town, Digital Reasoning, that's doing all this like hide big data stuff. There's a robotics companies. There's um, there are all these um, things that just the people didn't know about each other. And so now if you graduate, the young, you know, these, these brilliant young kids that graduate from here, they don't necessarily have to leave because we know enough about what's going on to say, hey, there's a company over here that you should go to. Whereas in the past, that company was there. We just didn't know they were there. And so that's the kind of thing we're trying to build the linkages. And so I think once we have that, that we truly have it. I give sort of the counterexample would be Huntsville. Huntsville has the highest per capita PhDs in the country, uh, just two hours from here. Maybe an hour and a half if you drive a Porsche. Uh, but the um, let's make it clear, David and I don't drive Porsche. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, drive, people. I drive, drive, drive my sister's Porsche. Porsche. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but the um, my uh, sense there is because of this, this sort of military um, contractor culture of yeah. secrecy, they don't know what's going on. And I That's taught interesting. A, I taught a class down there in prototyping. Um, it's just through this, the, business, the local business center, and there were three of us, and we went down there. We were teaching a class, three professors from Vanderbilt. Um, and the, in the class, I w we were talking about some prototyping thing, and someone said, oh, I just need these circuit boards made. You know, but it's so hard to make them in China. I have to go there. And this guy goes, wait a minute, I could do that in my garage. Hmm. And they live like you know, two blocks from each other. They had no idea because they're trained not to talk about what they're working on, the interests they're working on. And so being in the university is awesome in that way because we talk about what we do. Right. I was going to say a university setting is, is very, very different. And I think it is interesting if you look at – cities that kind of are taking off mm -hmm. in innovation, obviously Silicon Valley, but you look at Boston, Cambridge yes. yeah. with the university clusters there. You have MIT. Um, I think you're seeing an interesting renaissance in Cleveland. Yes, right. With yeah. Cleveland Clinic, Case Western, mm -hmm. and, you know, a kind of a more of a tech culture, innovation culture, yeah. information technology culture. So um, talk to me a little bit about these classes you've taught. You were the first faculty member that taught in the Wondery. Yeah. Um, and uh, you you know, were, were in many ways part of, I guess, a team Michelangelo that designed the Wondery. <laughs> um, it is really wonderful. Yeah. But um, you've got a new class. I mean, you and I were in the space the other day. New product design and development. Yes. Talk talk to me and the audience about that class and, you know, how you make things with students. Yes, we do. Yeah. So it's a class where we basically uh, find need. Er well, the first thing we find is a customer. And that customer often has some kind of need. Um, early when I started the class back in the you know, early 2000s, actually, uh, we were making uh, – 
accessories for iPods, and there happens to be an iPod accessory company in town, and they happen to um, have that need, and I happen to the soccer coach with the founder's you know, <laughs> sister. And, uh, and anyway, again, like the sort of the network of Nashville uh, kind of thing. Um, so having a client, and we would design things with students. And so over the years, actually, but this class has been going quite a while. So the kind of prototyping and making of stuff would happen generally either in the lobby of Owen, so in the business school lobby, and yeah. we'd get screamed at when there's solder falling on the carpet <laughs> and burning the carpet, and I would have to bring everything in. And where's yeah. that noise coming from? What's yeah. Owen's doing again? Yeah. Um, and now for the fast forward to the Wondery, the Wondery is a place where there are a lot of tools. There are the, um, there's two maker spaces inside. Um, and so uh, sort of graduated clients, we work with the Children's Hospital now. And the Children's Hospital is the primary client for us. And they, I formed teams. Uh, last year had six teams. This more recently had four teams. And the teams basically find need areas, maybe the emergency department. Um, the, the projects this year, one was calming. So if I'm in the uh, caregiver, some adverse thing happens with my patient, I get stressed out, mm -hmm. and so how do I calm down? How do I make wow. the calming happen? And I think that's a, it's a very subtle thing. Yeah. And there apparently is a, uh, this machine called the Vecta machine, it's like, you know, $10,000 machine that, was that you can... In, was that in Back to the Future? <laughs> May, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, the, yeah. What's it called? The Vecta. And the it has Vecta. like, a, a carp, uh, it has um, fiber optics, it has like this bubble thing, it's got music, it's got sound, you sort of enter into it, and, and they use it for behavioral patients, actually, for young pediatric behavioral patients. Wow. It truly calms you down. Um, so that's where they started. They were basically the need was we sort of need one of those machines, oh. um, and we really can't figure out where to put it. And so the team got in. They really started thinking about it and looking at it and talking to people and, and do, building prototypes. And what the final product ended up being was basically a little round bandage, band aid, you know, like little round band aids yeah. with a little bit of cooling gel and some aromatherapy on it. And wow. the idea would be you put one on the temple oh. when you had one of these events. Wow. And it was a little bit cooling, so it was calming. It was, the aromatherapy was there. Yeah. But it would also signal to other people, I'm stressed oh. or I'm in that state. Yeah. And so they would behave differently towards you, and that could help bring the uh, – That's a brilliant low yeah. cost. Yeah, so you start with this $10,000 yeah. thing down to this really, really simple thing. And it's only th sort of through the process that you begin to make it um, – simple enough. And so we've had so many projects where it starts out like, oh, I'm just going to do this big IT thing and we're going to put a board here and put RFID on everyone. And, and that ends up being really something simple, like, like let's just get some crayons in there yeah. <laughs> to help things. The emergency department was one. Um, one of the biggest needs in the emergency department after only after studying it was uh, charging stations for phones. And oh. so what would happen is Johnny falls off the monkey bars, cracks his head open. Yeah. And so you throw Johnny in the car, you drive to the emergency department. You get out, the valet park your car, you get inside, Johnny's being seen, and now what do you do? You have to start calling everyone. You say you've got to start calling, texting. Yes, and then your phone dies. Where's your charger? Well, it's in the car. Where's the car? Ah, uh, not sure. And so just really, really simple things like that that come through observation and, and those. The building of stuff is, um, it's both kind of trivial, but also kind of very powerful. A lot of students nowadays don't build stuff anymore. I took Auto Shop. I took Home Ec, I took uh, my my uncles would you know have would do stuff with me. I would make stuff myself, and I don't think that happens quite as much in this virtual world that a lot of young people live in. And so when people make stuff, it's actually really powerful to them. Although they try to make it perfect, they try to make it like an Apple iPhone. Hmm. It's like that's we just want duct tape and a toilet paper roll, right? <laughs> that's the level of prototyping, um, because it's not about the prototype. It's about what you learn from the prototype. Um, my secret thing with that class, my secret sort of, of um, um, uh, idea of, of where this is going to go, subversion, let's call it, is to really talk about design as research. And design is sort of a series of hypothesis testing um, uh, um, steps that you do to say, like, you know, the world would be better if this happened or if, 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 if this phone worked this way. And then what are the hypotheses I have to develop and test in order to say, like, that's true or not? And if it's not true, then don't make it. And if it's true, then make the thing. And working that way. Yeah. I think uh, I'm just uh, really overwhelmed by your ability to kind of see what you'd call the invisible electron part of, <laughs> okay, at the end of the day, there's a device, there's a, an iPhone, and it's got a lot of software. It's got all this computing power. Yeah. But yet it's a thing. And as I spend time in the Wondery, um, and I think it's an important point, which is the iPhone started out, you know, maybe as someone putting pieces of cardboard together to say, yeah. could we ever have something this big? 
this thin. Yeah. And our students learning how to make things that are tangible and the 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 wondry having so much maker space I think is important because at yeah. some point you have to have a product. Right. And you're not going to finish with an iPhone, so you better start with something. Yes. And you don't have a lot of venture money. <laughs> yes, right. So yeah. toilet paper rolls, mm-hmm. cereal boxes, duct tape. Yeah. You know, those might be be really, really good things, which, which kind of brings me to another uh, important class you're teaching, which is product realization. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we particularly at the university, we have something called the Valley of Death. I've got this really good idea. I've got this invention. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Well, how are you going to get it into a product? Oh. Right, right. And a lot of things will die in the so-called valley of death because people don't know how to get it to market, which that's what investors are right, going to ask. Right, that's right. So tell us about that class yeah. and things you try to uh, communicate with, with the students and you know, kind of uh, – what you think you're seeing among the Vanderbilt culture okay. and student body. Yeah, that class is the brainchild of Marie Thursby, who did a, a similar thing at, at Georgia Tech. And the idea there is basically you take uh, a graduate student in law and business and a PhD student with some kind of technology they're working on. You pair them up, and then you have them basically work on their plan. It is um, – so one of the distinctions I would make is the fact that they're all graduate students is sort of a different kind of, of, of learning yeah. progression that you're doing. So with undergrads, my goal really is to teach them um, the process. And so then if they become graduate students and in that other class and they know enough about the process where they can really focus on the content of it. Um, but some of the things I just uh, ran into, I was in the Wondery the other day, saw a couple of students uh, working on a um, – which is basically a steerable needle for surgery. Right. And so we don't have to drill through the head or cut the top of the head off to get in there. They can come up through the sinuses or different places like that. Um, they had printed out a 3D model of a skull. They had printed at least 15, I, I saw in their little case, 15 different hand sh- shapes of that thing they were wow. working on. And they were basically giving them to doctors say, how would this work? How would this one work? How would this one work? How would this one work? And it really reminded me of uh, there's a... Um, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a famous picture. There's a famous picture for product designers, like I once was, um, of how many mouse models they did before to come up with the Logitech mouse. There's like a hundred different um, mouses of different shapes, of different you know. If the hands this big, what would it feel like? If it's square, mm. if it's round, if it's there's like just a picture of them all sort of arrayed really? on a table. Yeah, and they're all just slightly different. I saw another similar thing of toothbrushes. Toothbrush handles, right? All these different ones, and the fact of three D printing, which the Wondery has a couple. They're actually probably, I guess, there are like forty three D printers on campus. They just didn't know about each other, hmm. and so, um, so, so giving the surgeon something to say, yeah, that would work. Or no, my thumb normally sits here. Like, can you make it that way? Um, and so that that steerable needle, for example, is one. I know another project that's going through is one on. Um, cleaning uh, the blood using a physical, like basically almost centrifuging someone's blood as a form of dialysis hmm. to get sort of some of the impurities out. And, and there's a really simple idea. There's um, a thing called uh, breast GPS, 3D imaging, uh, well, basically a, a GPS for lumpectomies that you do. And so these are higher end kinds of projects than, than undergrads could do. They don't hmm. have the knowledge yet. But if you have a PhD student who's that is their area and you're able to push them um, – it's not really pushing them. It's basically supporting them with the law part, with the engineering part. I think that's a, a big deal. And it also um, really reinforces, I think, something that I've picked up as part of our strategy as a, as a university is that uh, there aren't that many academic spots <laughs> available. And if you are a PhD student in biomedical engineering, the expectation that you're going to go into that is probably – um, it's like as you know, a football player saying, "I'm going to go into professional sports," and most right. of them don't. I understand there are more black cardiologists than there are football. I mean, f- professional athletes as a whole. Right. And so, um, these other having these students, first of all, experience the business part, so they could go into that. Which you know, if they became academics, they'd be more successful at getting grants. They'd be more successful at getting stuff into the tech transfer office. But even if they don't, they're able to get their um, products, the thing that they're investing so much of their time and effort into. And for me, society invests in people to go allow them to go get a PhD and allow them to sit in front of that rig and allow them to gather that data. And so the more likely that thing is to get out into the world, the better investment we've all made uh, uh, in that. And so that's, well, that's the importance of that class for me. That's why I think it's really an important thing to support. 
I was uh, talking to one of our undergraduates the other day, and he uh, was all excited because he said, uh, I've developed, this was after the election, mm -hmm. he said, you know, people aren't talking to each other, and um, the, the kind of companies that we're seeing um, are uh, really in many ways contributing to a lot of the silo sort of thinking, and uh -huh. people read what they want to read. They, they kind of listen to what they want to listen, and I'm going to solve this. Okay. And uh, I'll give a plug. He's uh, got a, a prototype co uh, that's called Junto. Okay. Uh, and um, his name is Eric Yang. And I was so excited because he was excited. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and right, right, he was yeah. saying, you know, I just think maybe Facebook doesn't engage people enough. And right. Maybe anonymity is not good and... And, you know, there was this kind of admiration for he's going to take this big idea yeah. on. And <laughs> right. he's not going to – he didn't talk about I'm going to be a billionaire. Yeah. And yeah. and I don't think Mark Zuckerberg, when no, no. he did this – Some of his friends would be impressed with, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so what do you say to Eric Yang about this sort of project? Yeah. Because there is so much – you know, almost lottery money that, boy, you know, now yeah. someone eight years out of college is worth $8 billion or two years out is worth mm -hmm. $50 million. Mm -hmm. And I worry it gets to be like pro sports, which is, yes, right. you exactly. know, if you kind of say, well, you know, look at Bill Gates. Well, look at the 30 computer companies that didn't make it. Right. Oh, it's it more is, than 30. <laughs> yeah. It's, I remember my friends, K-Pro. Yeah. Oh, and, and Apollo. I mean, yeah. there are all these companies yeah. that were big companies. Compact. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And so do you see the these kind of young people really driven by a passion to do good? And yeah. even if it's a pie-in-the-sky thing for these young people, isn't that what we're here to support them on? Yes. So that, that's it's a really, uh, uh, I think, important point. So the in the um, so my my thinking about that. So I have, it's it's complicated because you touch on a lot of really uh, interesting points. So one point is is the um, I think if we focus on the success or failure being measured in terms of dollars, that that's really the wrong metric for us, especially as a university. But I think for young people in general, that you want people to have experiences, you want people to take risks, you want people to do things. And if I tell everyone I'm going to you know topple Facebook and I don't, then like that's a big failure. Even if I you know generate a little company out of that, even if I you know create a couple jobs, even if I create some pleasure in the world from people interacting with my with my product. Um, so I tend to try to discourage. The saying like, well, um, how much money are you going to make? And try to think about getting people to a point where they realize the need that they're addressing is so important that they're a schmuck if they don't do it. Mm. So uh, in, in some of my product, uh, uh, in my product development classes, for example, there's a um, problem called uh, infiltration. It's where you put an a, a a IV into a kid. Kid wiggles a lot and the IV either comes out or it pokes out of the vein but stays under the skin and you're pumping whatever fluid under their skin. And the... I could just sort of see for the students working on that project, there came a point where they said, wow, like this sucks. Like this is really a big <laughs> problem. It's, it's painful. It's wasteful. It takes forever. It happens, you know, there's so many times. Like we are total schmucks if we don't fix this. Regardless of how much money they make, regardless of mm -hmm. anything, even if they open source the solution, whatever, it's like this is so important that it really matters. And so for young people like Eric, I would um, – get them back in touch with the thing that sort of was, was the magic, the thing that sort of drew them to it. You can still have your heroes and you can still say, oh, I want to be Michael Jordan or I want to be, you know, Sarah Blakely or who founded Spanx or I want right. to be, you know, Mark Zuckerberg. And so, um, so, so that, that's a part of it there. Get in touch with the need. The second part is I think the more broad or the more um, doing good we offer – people to do it in different ways, the more likely we are to attract different kinds of people into the innovation process. So um, if it's all tech, uh, we know computer science is dominated by men. We don't see very many women there. And there's some arguments that's because they're just talking about, well, let's write a program and see, and not saying, let's do something to help babies in incubators. Hmm. And, and if you phrase it that way, you get a lot different kinds of people, a lot more kinds of people. Even people who are an English major say, well, I can help a baby in an incubator, but I can't write code. But I can right. help a baby in an incubator. And so you get more people to show up. And so with, in, in the Wondry and in, even in its position in the provost's office as opposed to in one of the schools right. allows that to happen. And we're really pushing inside to say we're not an entrepreneur center. 
We're an innovation center, right? First and foremost. Well, you you also <clears throat> make a really important point uh, important point about these uh, very very important goals that we all have. Certainly, a priority for myself, which is diversity and inclusion and equity. And I think what what's important in what you said is that's how you get creativity and innovation. Yeah. Which is if you have group think. Yes. You will eventually fail because you're not going to take into that's account. Correct. Yeah, that's absolutely so right. So you yeah. see, and and this is, uh, this is you know, my strong stuff, view. Yeah. This project that we all have on diversity and inclusion is essential. Yes. To our success as a university, yeah. particularly as a research university of the highest order right. that values innovation. It's like you say. I'm an English major, or I grew up where you know there was high child mortality. And even though I'm an English major, yeah, then I get this connection from. That, I yeah. get this connection, mm -hmm. and maybe the code is great, but you're ignoring other issues yeah. that you've not experienced. How does the mother feel about all these how tubes the going into feel? this baby? Right. Yeah, right. or how does how does right? Yeah, that's right. That's, absolutely. Yeah, right. Um, and what are the hierarchies within that society itself? Yeah. And so I think that's a that that's a really really great point. Um, you've also been a global celebrity. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm very proud to say that Vanderbilt was you know really one of the first Coursera partners, yeah. and um, again you leading the pack, you know, kind of jumping right in. I think everyone stepped backwards, and I was left standing. Well, uh, and I remember. Um, you telling me you you made your own video recorder or something in the garage. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know I had My Steve Wozniak and and, and, <laughs> and yeah, Jobs and Wozniak in and the there. garage. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what was your experience teaching thousands of people in a course on innovation? Talk talk a little bit about that yeah. experience. It was a bit. Um, I feel like it was. I don't know if I was almost foolish to try to do it. It just it. But it just sort of seemed to be in the right place. I had these interests in, you know, in, in film and how do you make a movie. I had interest in audio recording. And it just seemed like, be okay, and I'm interested in innovation. And they say they want a class in innovation. I know how to videotape. I know how to do that. And so it just seemed obvious to put them together. But it was really a um, – the, some, the, some things I learned about myself, first of all, that I'm super – um, I seem kind of extroverted, but I'm super shy, actually. And so I had a friend who was videotaping my things, and I eventually had to kick him out. Like, I can't have anyone in the room right, right. when I do it. And so when I did that, I had to put some technical things into place in order to be able to record myself from a, you know, from a, right. from across the room with, yeah. and control the computer and be able to see my script and do all that stuff without um, having another person there. Right. And so that and caused lots of... conscious yeah, so I yeah. had to, you know, basically invent. I actually didn't invent, but I basically build a teleprompter out of I had an old picture frame and some foam core and put something together. It sort of worked, you know, it sort of worked. I had to figure out how to turn my slides backwards so I could read them from, uh, from the front. I um, I composed all the music for the. Um, little intros and things, and the early one had um, um, lots of that. And it became almost a, uh, um, just a fun project, like something I would do for myself at home. I do all kinds of crazy stuff at home. I brew beer. I uh, have made recently a ping pong scoreboard because my wife and I play ping pong. And Who wins, we, you or Jennifer? Jennifer wins. Okay. Uh, right. but, but not always by a lot. Okay. Um, but the, I helped to build a scoreboard electronic scoreboard because we you know have a couple of glass of wine and we start arguing about the score and so <laughs> we have to maybe you let it over for a double day <laughs> ping pong it sounds That's right, yeah. no we is did it, is it is it more teched out than wimbledon uh it's pretty tech but uh funny do you have line this. calls <laughs> no, no, I'm putting the laser in, right, for that. <laughs> no, and we actually went to and Milwaukee. You can't have one of your daughters come out. No, no. We, and and no. kind of, you know, run for the ball or right, something. Right, right. Like no, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of, it's fun. Yeah. Actually, we went to, uh, uh, just told us, we went to Milwaukee for an anniversary trip, too, because they have a ping pong nightclub there called Spin. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. But anyway, the, um, I forgot what we were talking about. We're <laughs> I was talking about Coursera. Oh, right, yeah. So, yeah. Um, the interesting thing there was that the um, Coursera goes out to anyone. So there's kids in Africa, there are PhDs in Sweden, and there's everything in between that are taking the course. And I found it interesting to try to have um, how many kids? How many? Uh, I call them kids, David. Yeah, because we're there was. All, uh, I, mean, we're I think all at this learning. point we're counting. Uh, it's it's been at least 140,000. Wow. 
And so it's a lot of people. It's more than I would have ever in, in 50 lifetimes ever yeah. been able to teach. Yeah. So there's a part there also of, of yeah. that. And I use the, the v- film that I record in lots of other contexts now. Oh. But the um, doing something creating a, a way of communicating with someone that a you know a 15 year old in a really low resourced area could c- consume and there were some issues about they wanted to be able to download them and play them on their phone because whenever they have connection and they don't have connection right. they had to think about that but then at the same time you know this this uh, these think tank innovation researchers in, in Sweden would call up or would basically you know g- question in and and ask really sophisticated questions about what uh, and what you we were had talking to about them all? I didn't have to answer them all. I had to create a way to uh, – uh, first of all, my, my basic communication had to be sort of accordion style where I could sort right. of meet people where they are. Right. Um, and then the um, – I had lots of help with TAs. There's a, a, he's a currently a PhD student here, Ben Shapiro. It was unbelievably awesome. But you could actually go into the cor- discussion forums and they would be moving faster than you could read. And so, because you know it's it's twenty four seven because of the right. you know sundown, it was just then the, they would the Chinese people ask questions, then the Australians would ask questions, and the, wow. yeah, and so um, and so what I ended up having to do was to say I'll give one hour per day, and wherever I start, that's where I start, and wherever I stop, that's where I stop, uh, and then the TAs helped a lot with sort of going through, but. Um, once we got the base questions in, we were able to, to resolve, basically to, to refine the material so that you could sort of stop some of the questions, that mm-hmm. is, make things clear that are causing questions. And then for me personally, I have good, great colleagues now around the world who think about innovation at a very high level. Mm-hmm. And so in that sense, it's kind of cool. And then also, I was in the AutoZone the other day, and someone said, hey, I know you. And he was wearing a, um, a, a reverend thing. What do you yeah, call yeah. it? The collar? Yeah. yeah. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, you know me. Well, it's good if the Reverend maybe yeah. thought you were at church. <laughs> and so the um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's what I was thinking. And he said, "Oh yeah, no, I saw your course on Coursera." Wow. And I thought, "Wow, here's a Reverend watching the course in Nashville." Yeah, um, I, so it's pretty I think, cool. Uh, what I think is exciting is, and, and I think it's true of some of the surgical devices that you've been working on. Um, we create so much knowledge at Vanderbilt. Yes, and you know we have thirteen thousand students and. We're a research university, and it's hard to do a lot of that online. Right. Oh, absolutely and, right. You know, it's residential, but I think the the mistake people made with online education was to underestimate low resourced areas and the moving out of knowledge right. that is transformative to people around the world. Yeah. And I think there was a lot of mistake in the analysis, like, well. If I'm at Vanderbilt or Stanford, how do they get that experience? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, that's really ethnocentric to say that's the experience. That's the experience they should have. That they should have. Right. Or that you want. And so how do you move knowledge out to people around the world? I saw a photo one time and I it was a prize winning photo and I think it was taken in um, Somalia. And it was uh, hundreds of people holding up their iPhones mm. to get signals. Oh, huh. And I thought, well, that's the promise right. of Coursera. That's the promise yes. of a global community of learners. A um, little more time-consuming and expensive than you thought as well, wasn't it? <laughs> I remember it says, oh, oh yeah. this is easy. Oh, yeah. No, I thought, have to be that's right. And Especially if you're a person. I remember seeing you, and it's like... <laughs> Well, you know, I didn't know you were playing so much ping pong. Maybe yeah, I wasn't yeah. playing a whole lot then. Yeah, it was, it's it's the cost model is much more complex too. Isn't yeah, it? but it's been paying dividends. I mean, it's been paying a lot of that 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 investment has been paid off because I can use the. I've totally flipped my in person. Yeah, classes. I was going to say now. Tell me about how you're using it at home base. Yeah, so at home base, my students watch the, the videos. Value. Absolutely, yeah. They they so in one context I use it. Uh, we have an America's MBA. Yeah, they do these residencies. Right. And when they come on the executive MBA is every Saturday for all day, and then you're away for two day, for two weeks, and you come back all day. And so you imagine during that day they hook you up like it's foie gras, and you know they're like stuffing that <laughs> stuffing that that, that, know, that knowledge like that in. <laughs> <laughs> and so the students can't learn. And so basically, what I'd have them do is I have them watch their the videos before they get to class, and then we do that. And I do that with my in person also. So all the lecturing, the boring stuff, the stuff you could read, that happens at home. And when they come together, I do the tacit stuff, the stuff I work with lots of companies, and I'm picking up things here and there, like use a super sticky or use the black sharpies. The red ones are no good. Use, you know, just really, really simple <laughs> yeah, stuff that yeah. makes it work. Yeah. 
And so I'm able to transfer that kind of knowledge. I think that's the most important thing um, that they can get. We're still learning. The students are still learning that when you watch a lecture online and then come class and do come to class and do things, you know, that, that involve coaching or projects, that that's still learning. It's not. That's not an online class. It really is. It's a flipped class, but it's not an online class. And so that's something I think where where the younger students get it. The older students are still in the old model. Whereas if he's not standing there talking at me, right, this is not a class. Right, and I think we're seeing also generational changes in yes, faculty. Yeah, yeah that too. And, right? yeah. you know, kind of a young postdoctoral or new assistant professor might have different paradigms or even different framing mechanisms yeah. for how they think of a classroom or themselves. And, you know, I've always thought that the, the goal at Vanderbilt should be you bring the most talented, diverse people and we're all just on different developmental paths. Mm-hmm. Like and the 18-year-old is smarter than I am, but my value is getting them in a space that develops- Building an environment for them. That real upside. Yeah. And passive learning is not going to drive that as much. Yeah. And this is from somebody who's taught in a law school where, you know, it's like, okay, I'm the Socratic deity and I will question you for an hour. And, uh, you know, no, as you say that, it brings me back to what I said earlier, the, one of the first things I said, which was uh, the back of my physics professor's head, yep. um, which was it was just so disembodied from anything that I could could sense was important or was real. I mean, I knew that, that there was knowledge there, but I just didn't know why that mattered. Right, right. And so these classes where I can actually apply things, even if it's just, you know, just a, a small piece of a, a small problem, at least it, it's the piece I solved. Uh, David. Um, you know, you've done amazing things at Vanderbilt. You know, we all have so much admiration for you. Um, I would also want to point out that you've done consulting for Lego, <laughs> Apple, Dell, Cisco, <laughs> NASA, um, NASA <laughs> Coleman Camping. You know, you're working on the stoves. You served as a CEO. You worked at Nissan Leaf, uh, done work for them. What do you bring from that experience in the business world? Mm -hmm. And then do you bring things from the academy to them reciprocally? Yeah, that's good. I... um... One thing uh, that's different about working with companies like that is they want they they want to know that it's theory based, but they don't want to know the theory. Right. They want to know how is this actually applied in some case. And so for me, it's always a, really a test case of like saying, "Hey, you know, I think this. And I saw three companies doing this. Would that apply here?" And then when it doesn't work, I say, "Okay, why well, didn't that apply? That must be something different about that context or about those people." And so for me, it's it's constantly a thinking thing. I think the um, so that and also that need to be immediately. Um, uh, um, applicable or immediately, you know, that, that of, of, of immediate value is, is sort of interesting, which is different than when I'm on campus. I can think of things in a more longer term. And I can think of things in a more or think about things. Um, I can read more. I can bring things in. And so there's a nice balance between the the sort of taking the, the big picture view and the long view versus saying, like, okay, if, if, if that's true, how should it work in this company? Um, there's some basic things that we're really bad at designing organizations. We're really bad at organization design. And um, anytime that a, an org chart doesn't show all the connections it needs to, you know that that was like, you know, sort of a poor. Universities are kind of cool because universities have been in this forum for about a thousand years, mm-hmm. um, longer than any other forum. But most organizations, it's like it's hard to move information. It's hard to move things. Um, we're also not very good at running groups because we don't uh, recognize the need for process. And so we often rely on people who are good at that, but those people are intuitively good at that. Mm-hmm. And they don't put them in a different place or with different people. It doesn't work all of a sudden. Right. And so for, I see lots of eyes opening when I talk about some really basic social psychology stuff. Every social psychologist knows you know, that having an agenda matters. And sort of, you know, even like there's no philosophy or the- theory of having an agenda, but in right. fact, when you have one, right. <laughs> it means uh, a lot I'm, better I'm, than when you don't. Yeah. Uh, and so, so for me, the, the sort of the moving back and forth is really powerful. I feel so lucky that I, I have have had great colleagues, and I've had people who've connected me to other people. I've done, you know, work with those companies with the Smithsonian, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, with all kinds of like 200 arts organizations, and there. Um, those organizations are really interesting because also a lot of arts organizations are allergic to business. Yeah. And if you say, hey, I'm going to come in and teach you about, you know, oh, you're from a pro- for-profit, oh, yeah. like yeah, I don't yeah, want anything yeah, to do yeah. with that. And so the innovation can come in as a sort of almost a Trojan horse yeah. because we talk about innovation in terms of being sustainable. 
Right. You you know, if you're trying to have, uh, I met a young man trying to save the hula. Yeah. In California. Yeah. And he was trying to save the hula a day a week. Right? right? Not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so how do you build the sustainability into that? And so for him, it was really to say he had these models of how it is you do this thing called being a nonprofit, and I had to get him to change those. And if I say, hey, we're going to innovate together, he's open for that. Right. If I say, is I need that... you to change, uh, not open yeah. for that. Especially in the academy, we are always innovating. Yes. You know, We don't recognize it that way always. <laughs> I mean, I think we're in many ways the most innovative because – all the priors are questioned every day. Yeah. And then there's a foundation of knowledge. It's like now we think we know that. So let's move on yes. to yeah. hypothesis testing. But, but we I also would... don't have to struggle so much because of this thousand year organizational form. We aren't constantly trying to fit the environment. Right. So we can stay really focused on that generating knowledge part. Right. Yeah. Right. And testing knowledge. Right. I, I think also, and I mean, it's always been my view kind of coming from the law school, which is, you know, I'm very interested in legal theory. Mm -hmm. I've written yeah. about my areas and deep theoretical questions. But when I looked at those kids, I knew most of them were going to go out and be lawyers. <laughs> so how does one take deep theory yes. and translate it for great value? And uh, I think what universities do is, and I, I make this point all the time, which is I know you want to apply knowledge but you better generate new knowledge yes. because the application pipeline. So, you know, getting that it balance, expires also because the world changes. Right. What you know is not relevant because right. the world's not different. Relevant. Yeah. Um, so, uh, David, uh, before we close, um, I really want to thank you, and oh, I don't. Uh, I, I I just have tremendous admiration for you. Um, in many ways, you embody um, all the goals of Vanderbilt, mm. multidisciplinary. Uh, multi, you're global, multicultural, and embracing of diversity. Mm -hmm. um, you're rigorously scientific, but you know, kind of, you, you, you're 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 also a tinker in your own house. <laughs> yeah, right. um, I'm just going to bring up a different topic. Um, you were born in Germany. Yes, I was. Yeah. yeah, and then when did you move to the U.S.? Or was your dad moving constantly? He was moving constantly, but my parents were. Uh, my dad was stationed in in Augusta, Georgia, in 1963. I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, it was illegal for them to be married, and yeah. so my mother, after that rotation, they were rotated back to Germany. She said, "I, you know, I've had enough. Don't want to necessarily live in the U.S." Mm. Um, after that experience, and this so, is uh, early 60s. Yeah, early 60s yeah. and loving it against Virginia. Yes, exactly. Was, I think 1967. And we also have to realize that just because the Supreme Court says something's okay. Augusta, Georgia has mean, a little bit. <laughs> well, little anywhere in America, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. So, but the uh, army was the army was very um, integrated and super, uh, and it just it, so anyway for for various reasons. Also, you know, my my grandmothers and all the aunts and uncles. So I moved to we moved around inside Germany. Lived all over Germany. Hmm. Every summer would go to Augsburg, which is where my family's from, uh, my my maternal family. Um, my parents still live in my house in the house that was my grandmother's house. Um, now and the um, in Germany in Germany yeah and the uh, I came over uh, when I was 18 to go to college Stanford and I had were no you... idea where it was I was looking on the map on the little yeah. like cocktail napkin map thinking like okay where's L A compared to San Francisco <laughs> I had no idea <laughs> well uh, uh, you know, obviously you 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 made an impact there and yeah, taking a year yeah. off to make stereo equipment sell stereo punk band uh, was yeah, in there punk too band, that's great <laughs> David um, were you surprised at college sports when you came from Europe. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, talk to me a little bit because Europe doesn't have college sports. It has a lot of big sports. Yes. So did you grow up playing soccer? I grew up playing soccer. Some soccer, yeah. I mean, I was not good. I was usually the, the goalie. Because, man, that guy can't run. <laughs> uh, what are you going to say? He's tall and he can't run. You were run. brave, <laughs> courageous, and you didn't mind being in the spotlight. That's right. Stick him in the goal. There's nothing uh, worse, by the way, that when you're – Oh, it's, your like, it's like all this gets, boredom. And your then, little <laughs> kid gets picked for a goalie. It's like, okay, there's no glory to that uh, job. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So well, I was exposed to lots of American sports, but never yeah. had to throw the college thing. And yeah. so the thing that struck me was that the um, the, the, the sort of – 
sports seemed to be in the U.S. In my opinion, was what ended up being like if you're really good at it, you get to do it, and if you're not, like you don't do it. Huh. Whereas there was much more. There's like a community league, and then there's uh, mm-hmm. you know the we'd call now like the under 35 basketball yeah. league right. at the Y or something like that, and that's widespread. And their whole leagues, you know, there's the thing called the Premier League, right? But there are leagues below that, huh. and so people would play, and people, and they would be considered playing professional soccer if you did that, and then you still had to go to work, right? Um, on really? Monday, yeah. And so there is a, a, a place for that, and and it's sort of more, um, um, sort of diffused, more different sports, lots yeah. of you know, like there's canoeing, there's badminton, there's curling, there's all those that. Um, in a college like a university like Vanderbilt, you'll see lots of the different kinds of sports, um, but you know the kind of stuff we watch on TV for college sports we don't really see. And so I, I get used to it. And people ask me, "What you know? What did you think of the game last night?" And I'm thinking like, "Oh, I don't know what game, so I better." <laughs> yeah, you better get on that. But you I'm too busy. I'm too busy in my garage. SEC like... <laughs> channel, ESPN. No, I'm too busy in my thing. Thinking, yeah. oh no, my yeast died for my next brew. I have to. How am I going to do here? Yeah, how's the beer coming? I love making beer. It's been uh, it's good actually. It's there's so much there. It, it's like it's like there's sort of this easy entry. You can go buy a kit, right? And then when you start getting into it, you realize that, okay, the water matters. Like I have too much calcium in the water. Like how yeah. am I going to fix that? And then you realize the yeast. Okay, now the yeast. My yeast are are they're growing too fast, or they're growing too slow, or there's too much fat in the um, you know in the cyto whatever. Um, and then they're, like the whole world there, and then you realize, oh, the grain. Oh gosh, the grain. Now let me think about grain. And there's yeah. two row and six row. Where do you and... get your? Uh, where do you get the yeast and the grain? Uh, there's a couple great brew stores here in town. Yeah. Um, one is uh, All Seasons. Yeah. And then there's a um, place called Craft Brewed, and they have 20 Tennessee beers on tap. Right. And then they also sell grain and stuff like that. But there's also one of the biggest online retailers uh, called Rebel Brewer is in Hendersonville. Hmm. And so you can go up there. I buy 50 50 pound sacks of grain, and I also have a yeast uh, farm at home in the garage. In the um, I can't. I'm not allowed to keep it in the house. <laughs> <laughs> but in my refrigerator in my shop, yeah, I have a yeast farm. I probably have like 30 or 40 different kinds of yeast in there, and that uh, <laughs> just pull a colony and grow it up, and yeah. then you can make some beer with that. So beers making beers time consuming. What's the name of the? Uh, what are the names of some of the labels, David? Of the labels of beer. Of yours. Kind of, oh, I don't. Oh. Uh, the I mean, kind have of, been in any competitions? No, or? no, no, no. I'm. Are you going to bring a couple of beers? My neighbor across the street makes beer. Yeah, yeah, and I tasted it. He brought it pretty good. You know the the. I grew up uh, in Milwaukee, so yeah, you I'm probably never have... a big beer fan, believe it or not. But I've got a pretty sophisticated. You could bring me ten wines from around the world. Mm. I couldn't tell the difference, but. You know, I, I, I yeah, can I was too self. Beer. I don't know if it was, I was self conscious or not, looking for public scrutiny about my beer. But I'll tell you, um, there's a, a brew champion on this campus, Mark Forster. He makes oh, prize winning brews. Yeah, really? Yeah. Uh, and I've gone in a little bit into ciders lately. Ciders yeah. are easier because yeah. you don't have to cook them. The yeah. cooking uh, to, when you make beer. When I make beer, it starts at eight a.m. and it ends about six p.m. Uh-huh. It takes all day. Right. And then um, cider takes about ten minutes. Just pour some yeast in there, pop it, and then, then they have to wait a year. Right. <laughs> but uh, but it's there. But yeah. So there's a um, there's also someone I was in someone's lab recently somewhere in the bowels of the medical center, and he had a little yeast farm in there too. But he had all the equipment like the stirrers and all that kind of stuff on um, there, and he study actually studies yeast. Yeah, it's a it's a really they use important yeast as vehicles uh, for other yeah. You know, a lot a lot of big medical discoveries are made from. You know, potential beer makers right, and bread right, makers. Right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, they're great. They're great. They're great. A uh, lot of the early science was driven by uh, Carlson Brewery, for example. Uh, Louis Pasteur worked for them. There were, really? yeah, oh yeah. There's a lot of of um, like discovery of yeast, pasteurization, um, uh, it, a whole bunch of others. Water chemistry was all funded by uh, breweries because they had an, a, a vested interest in understanding that the different yeah. kinds of yeast, you know, all that stuff. So, well, it also it's would, would yeah. kind of. The Europeans were so far ahead of America in basic sciences. Yes, at that time, going right. into the 1800s. Yes, and the you know kind of breakthroughs in chemistry and uh, you know it's it's not surprising that yeah. they were applying their scientific techniques. In, yeah, in to a very important cultural yeah. and, and economic yeah. engine, which is what I mean. As you say that, I know we're we're closing here. The um, thing I don't want to have people say in a hundred years is saying, "Wow, the U.S. was so good at that. Too bad um, it didn't carry on." And so, like you know, Europe was so good at that science is like, well, they're they're sending people here now <laughs> to yeah. learn. Well, that that's uh, that's an important point, which is, you know, there's nothing that determines where people will go to develop their 
human abilities. And, you know, there was a time where everyone went to Europe. Right. And, you know, there were... Now they there, come here? Now they come here. And, you know, uh, I think the the best uh, plan for Vanderbilt and um, our future is to make sure they keep coming here. Yes. And with that, we're going to close. And thank you very much, oh, David. Thank you. It's great really to see you. Keep to up you. the yeah. great work. All right. Thank you.